Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ken Foster. I'm the executive director here at YBCA. Um, welcome to the second of our six uh, Bay Area Now conversations. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a really uh, lively and engaging conversation about food. And today, we're going to have a similarly lively and engaging conversation about upward spirals, new economic models for a thrivable future. Um, before we get into it, I want to review what exactly it is that we're doing here so that everybody kind of understands. Um, in the circle are some of the artists that have been selected for the Bay Area Now exhibition and project that opens on July 9th and runs through October. Um, I say some because there are others who couldn't make it today, so there are people who kind of come in and out. Our intent with these conversations was to stimulate a dialogue within the artists that are part of the Bay Area Now project about some of the ideas that are, the innovative ideas that arise out of the Bay Area. It was our observation as we started to work on this project that lots of really creative ideas start in the Bay Area and emanate out into the rest of the world. We're not always sure that artists are part of that conversation and we wanna make sure that they are because we think that artists have a lot to contribute and a lot to say about that. So, um, we semi-coerced all these artists into doing this for these six uh, for these six conversations. So, hence the setup, which is that the first part of what we're going to do today is a conversation among the artists fr from the project and our speakers today, so that you get some sense of where this conversation is going. And there will be an opportunity for the audience members to participate in a more in a more uh, dynamic way in the at the second half of the program, and we'll talk about that. But for today, um, for now, uh, we're going to start with a couple of presentations. And we're going to begin with Marina Gorbis, who is going to do a presentation and followed by Neil, Neil Gorenflow. So let me tell you a little bit about Marina. Is she's the executive director of the Institute for the Future, a 42-year-old nonprofit research and consulting organization based in Silicon Valley. The Institute is dedicated to helping people think systematically about the future in order to make better decisions today. And Neil is the co-founder and publisher of Shareable Magazine, a nonprofit online magazine about sharing. As a former market researcher, stock analyst, and Fortune 500 strategist, Neil is perhaps an unlikely voice for sharing, since those are all very acquisitive uh, things there, Neil. Um, but a revelation in 2004 inspired Neil to leave the corporate world to help people share through internet startups, grassroots organizing, and a circle of friends committed to the common good. Um, I've had a, look at, a little bit of a look at what they're going to present today, as have many of the artists here, and I think it, um, you'll find it interesting and provocative and uh, uh, hope enjoyable. So we will begin first with Marina. get a chance to talk about economics to artists. So this should be a really interesting conversation. I'm, learning, I'm eager to learn from you as much as hopefully you learn from me. But as Ken said, at the Institute for the Future, we think about the future 10 years and more out. And when we think about the future, it's really necessary to think about the past because you want to understand what are the previous patterns. And particularly when you think about economics, I like to take a really big and long view at the past. And if you look at the past, it's, and if you look at kind of the organizations that inhabit our landscape, we didn't produ always produce everything through large organizations. We didn't always live in large organizations that dominated every aspect of our lives from government to economic organization to corporate organization. And it doesn't mean that people were just sitting idly doing nothing. They were engaged in making things and producing things, in trading things, but all of that was done kind of at the local level. People knew who they were trading with. They had social relationships. All of this was embedded in deep sort of rich social context. So you knew that you are not going to be selling rotten apples to your neighbor because maybe your son is going to be marrying the neighbor's daughter. Uh, or maybe you're going to run into each other at some event. So all of this, you knew all these familial interactions were taking place in a richly socially embedded context. If you think about the kind of organizations that populate our landscape today and what's been the biggest sort of innovation, if you look at corporate organization, and corporate organization 
doesn't mean just apply to corporate organization economic. We've organized most of our activities on this pattern. So our government organizations, our foundations, are basically run on the same model. And if you think about the significance of these kinds of organizations, they've taken what was previously socially local, familiar, and really scaled it up. So you don't always have to deal and trade with people who you know. You can trade with many anonymous entities that you have no idea who created the product, who made it, where it was sold, where it came from. You can aggregate all these activities and create the kind of scale that previously was really unattainable. So I think of an organization as a kind of, particularly the corporate organization that we created, as a kind of a technology for achieving this immense scale at the least profit, at the least cost. So it's a technology that allows us to achieve this kind of grand scale at minimal costs, minimal transaction costs. And that's, that's the bottom line. So all these sort of social relationships have been taken out of it, all the familiarities have been taken out of it and in, in order to achieve this scale. And part of this scale that is incredible <coughs> that we are able to achieve, um, it involved other kinds of tools and mechanisms and processes that are now familiar to us. So we all specialize. You, you have to specialize so you really excel in one little thing in, in the process. Um, mass production, as I said, grand scale. Uniformity, so like everything is produced in the same way, so something that works in one area can be scaled and produced in other areas. So along with the scale and this kind of mode of production, there are all these other kinds of innovations that we've created. And sometimes we've created such enormous scale that we're overproducing a lot of stuff. Um, it's commonly known, for example, that a lot of clothing that department stores don't sell, they end up being destroyed, they're being burned. Uh, same is happening with our food. We're actually overproducing food and we're destroying all of that. But the point is that it's economically better for us to overproduce and destroy rather than produce less. So that's another kind of side effect of this. And if you take kind of this notion of scale, that we've conquered scale by the beginning of the, at the dawn of the 21st century, in the period that we're living, we're actually conquered this whole notion of scale. This is a factory, this is called a lights out factory. It's just one example, it just happens to be a Japanese factory operated by a company called Fanuc. And basically this factory produces, it's robots that are producing other machines. Um, and it's producing it at grand scale, this particular factory can run by itself with no human intervention for about 50 days or more. Plus, it doesn't require heat, it doesn't require air conditioning, it doesn't require all kinds of other things. So if you take scale to its m kind of maximum extent, to grandest scale, um, really scale, we are the impediment to scale. Because if you think about all of those things, uniformity, specialization, all of these kinds of things that you can count, predictability, we humans are kind of an impediment to that. We, we are emotional, uh, we are sometimes unpredictable, we are idiosyncratic, we go on strikes, we do all these other things that kind of are impediments to scale. And if you look at, we're social, we're emotional, we are idiosyncratic, we're unpredictable, as I said, all of those things. So we can think of ourselves as kind of this impediment to scale. And really, when something, we've tried to create the kind of production that minimized all that human in us. Uh, that when we say something works well, we actually say, say it works like a well-oiled machine. So basically, the well-oiled machine means it's not social, it's not emotional, it's not idiosyncratic, it's all of that. So a lot of those human elements, and as artists, you probably know everything that's artistic, that doesn't fit, that's different, um, we try to take it out of the system in, in the search for this kind of scale. And I think we've kind of reached that point where, yeah, we've gotten scale, and we increasingly over the last, if you look at the data, over the last 40 years, um, 
a lot of things that were humans been taken out consistently out of all these processes that can be um, codified, that are wrote, wrote uh, sorry, I ran ahead here. Um, over the past 40 years, we've taken humans increasingly out of that kind of mechanistic production. So the question is, well, what's next? What kind of activities now we've taken ourselves out of rote, kind of codified, repetitive production. And that's happening, by the way, not just mani manufacturing, it's happening in services. There was an article today in the New York Times, I don't know how many of you read, that automation is taking jobs away from high-skilled lawyers because searching for data, you can look at masses of data and analyze patterns and find words and clusters of things that traditionally lawyers used to do. So increasingly, that kind of rote, whether it's manufacturing or whether it's in services, um, is going to be done by machines or automation. So the question is, what are we going to be doing? And I think this is good news for artists because all of those things that we, over the last 40 years, have been taken out of our production and creation of value is what's really valuable. Everything that's idiosyncratic, that's social, that's emotional, that's different, all of those things are actually, this is where our human competitive advantage is. It's about what is, if I were to say, where, where is our competitive advantage compared to machines? It's all of those things that machines can do. So what I'm interested in is I see us engaging in new forms of what I call social production which is to me what follows kind of industrial production, whether it's information or in other systems. And this is how I define in social production. It basically includes aggregated micro contributions, very small contributions, things that you can do in your spare time. Clay Shirky talks about, we all have this co cognitive surplus, which is we're spending on watching television or doing all kinds of other things or sitting in traffic. We have hours and hours of cognitive surplus. If we can just turn some of that cognitive surplus into contributing something as part of the social production, it's amazing what we can do. So it's micro contributions from large networks of people using social technologies and platforms to create new kinds of wealth. And so let me unpack this and show you some of the examples where I see this already happening. This is a, a platform developed by a few colleagues called Genomera. And you know about clinical trials. Clinical trials are usually done by pharma companies or they're done by large research organizations. This actually offers a platform for anybody to arrange clinical trials. So let's say you're just really interested in whether drinking green tea increases your energy level. You propose it on this platform. If there are enough people interested in doing this trial, they give you a template to do this and guide you through this process, but it's totally bottom-up production. So you can see how all, all of these things that were previously you needed, a large research organization, a large pharma company, you can basically self-organize to do clinical trials. And you can ask the kind of questions that maybe pharma companies are not asking and would never be asking. You can aggregate your friends and do a, a clinical trial. So that's happening, a lot of it in biology and health. There are lots of other examples of that. This is something that happened at the Institute, again, totally bottom-up production. Um, it's called a Science Hack Day, where 100 people, volunteers, not employees, showed up and they engaged over 48 hours in just self-organizing to solve problems and to produce products and to produce software. And some of them slept at the institute um, overnight. And as a result of that, they actually created eight products, software and other kinds of things that they're using for all kinds of social um, action kinds of projects, basically doing pro products for good. Um, interesting, because to me, this is new work. It's work that you're, it's self-driven. You volunteer to do it. Nobody assigns it to you. When you come, you're self-assigned. You, you go with what you're interested in. You do it maybe in spurts, and it's amazing what you can produce. It really kind of puts the whole 
question of what work is and who is an employer. None of these people are employees. None of them are paid. All of them are volunteers, doing, creating incredible kind of value, incredible forms of new production. And this is the last one, probably comes from more of the art world. This is an artist, Chris Whitaker. If you have a chance to look at it online on YouTube, this is called a virtual choir, where he pre created this choral and put it up online and asked people to, from anywhere in the world to basically sing a part. And 128 people contributed video of themselves singing this choral piece, and he aggregated it. And if you look at this incredible art creation, it's, it's just breathtaking. It's in um, different, sorry, different languages, um, different uh, people from different uh, parts of the world, and they're all connected. So we're kind of re weaving the world, but through these kinds of social platforms. And um, I'm gonna end here that to me, it does represent a new way of creating value, a new way of producing thing, a new way of kind of regaining our humanity in this process of production. And I just think um, it's, it's an exciting time for artists or anybody who didn't fit in and felt like they didn't belong or couldn't find their place. I, I think the premium is on novelty and not fitting in the box. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> so I was standing in a, uh, in a parking lot in a, of a warehouse outside of Brussels Airport. This was in, in 2004. And, um, and I had gone on a jog uh, my normal route in this industrial park near my hotel. I was working for a big corporation and sort of traveling between here and Brussels back and forth, kind of like three weeks here, three weeks there. And I've been doing that for it was six or eight months, something like that. And uh, so I stopped in this parking lot. It's a beautiful, uh, sunny Saturday afternoon, and I, and I started to cry. And, uh, and had this conversation with myself. Um, like, what was I doing with my life? And uh, why was I here? And, um, you know, I started to feel like uh, maybe I was wasting my time, that I was wasting my life. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and maybe I should be doing something else. And, and uh, I... I uh, then the conversation shifted, and, and, uh, and I started thinking, I started feeling, actually, uh, that there were many, many other people like me, m millions, uh, perhaps, uh, that were feeling exactly, exactly the same way, like really just kind of at sea, you know, lost, maybe lonely, and not connected to something that they're really passionate about. And then I really started to bawl at that time, at that point, and I, I was in the front of this parking lot and I walked to the side of the building, you know, I was kind of by the roadway, so I, I wanted to have this moment <laughs> by myself. And, and, uh, and I still remember the, the asphalt and the broken bits of glass and the faded bits of paper in this part of this, this parking lot and the weeds popping up through the cracks and the asphalt. Um, and, and uh, you know, when I felt that, that kind of that, that other people were in this sort of situation, um, you know, I, I made a vow to myself that I would, I would, you know, do whatever it took to create a life and, 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 and a community or a world where people could get connected to whatever they were passionate about, and have help, not be lonely, um, have real relationships. Um, and and uh, so I left. I, I, I brushed off my knees, got up, brushed off my knees, went to my, my hotel room, uh, wrote out a letter of res res resignation, uh, resigned, you know, sent off an email, and, and uh, rebooked my flight. And, you know, the next Monday I was back in, in San Francisco. And, um, and I, should, uh, I should back up a little bit, because, uh, you know, I had this moment, but a lot kind of led up to it. And, and um, you know, this, this six to eight month period, I was, uh, you know, I worked for this big company and we were doing this merger and integration project. And, you know, the bigger picture is, is that, is that, uh, 
you know, I had sort of, this had been an indoctrination to the global economy, uh, sort of values and practices and culture uh, of the global economy, and, and, I, and it was just like, yuck, I don't want that. That's not the kind of life I want. And, and just to kind of fill in the picture of what, what that, that meant is, is that I traveled constantly, and, and, and I was also constantly jet lagged, so I was neither here nor there. And, and uh, I was kind of like a zombie about a third of the time, you know, recovering from jet lag. And uh, the company I worked for, you know, everyone was nice. I, there, was, there were nice people. It was more of the context. Uh, you know, the, the mission statement was something like, you know, become the best box mover in the world. And that didn't exactly <laughs> speak to me. Um, and, you know, my close relationships started to suffer as I was just only a little while in one place or the other. And... Uh, kind of preoccupied with work as well, and, and uh, you know, my, everyone kind of became an acquaintance, and, and uh, you know, my most cherished relationships, like, sort of faded, and uh, at the time it was, um, you know, my uh, now wife, I was dating Andrea, and I was like, that, that was kind of starting to slip away, um, and, you know, the thing was that this was kind of a norm for workers like me, uh, uh, as I was spending a lot of time in, in Brussels, I started going to these, these expat parties. <clears throat> so these were, you know, professionals, 25 to 40, um, you know, probably working in the headquarters, European headquarters of a big multinational, you know, and some, you know, sort of mid-level job like me. And, and, uh, and, you know, half of them, I, you know, as I got to know them, half of them, it seemed like half of them were divorced. And, and I learned later that, that, you know, Brussels has the highest divorce rate in, in the European un Union. And, and to kind of top it all off, I mean, there's a little more to this than that, than that but that this is also an important piece is that, you know, I had worked for about six months on this, on this um, strategy for a business unit of, of uh, this company. And, and um, you know, the higher-ups loved it, raved about it, you know, I, and, and I went to great lengths and put all my intellectual energy into this, you know, I really was focused on it. Um, you know, it's hard for me to, like, do things halfway, you know, I really wanted to put everything into it, um, you know, and it involved lots of travel and trying to get consensus on the ideas and conference calls, you know, of three continents at the wee hours of, of the morning. Um, and I want, you know, I was really genuinely excited to, like, help execute it, but then they didn't fund it, and they didn't fund any of the plans at that time that any of my peers in the, in the department that I worked in had done for their various business units. So, so I was sort of like, what the hell was I doing there, you know? I mean, it's, let's just review that for a second. I had no community, no impact, no purpose, no strong relationships. I mean, and this was just sort of like normal. I mean, you know, it's, and that was kind of the problem, that, that that was normal. Uh, and I, I, I realized for myself at that moment in the parking lot that normal was totally effed up and just plain not good enough for me, that that is not what I wanted, not by a long shot. And I just came to that, that point in that parking lot that I just, you know, refused to settle for a medi mediocre life and for a life where my creative potential would not be realized. And, and uh, you know, I, I just felt like, you know, we deserve better. I mean, we deserve a better kind of reality, a better kind of social reality. And, you know, I had no idea how to get, how to get started when I landed back in San Francisco. I had this idea that, um, you know, sharing was really important. I already kind of had been thinking about that as a strategist always, you know, and being in San Francisco and thinking about social change, you know, kind of thinking that this was, you know, this was 2004. No one was really talking about this. It was sort of solar panels and hybrid cards and stuff like that. And, and sharing seemed like so totally simple. Like, why isn't anybody talking about it? So I, I sort of, you know, uh, decided to commit to learning about and doing things in, the, in this sharing whatever space. It wasn't really even a space. And, and I didn't really have a plan. I, the thing that I had was I was just completely committed. I was, but not the sort of like New Year's resolution sort of kind of committed. It's something that I felt like really in my bones, which was pretty new for me. It's a new experience. So, you know, when I got back, I just, I just dove in. You know, I took a year off, and I talked to everyone I could about sharing. You know, I volunteered at events. I read, you know, probably hundreds of books, or at least pieces of hundreds of books. And, you know, I did consulting projects for, for internet startups. And, and in April of 2005, I, 
I did something like what we're doing now. I started hosting these salons, but and and but doing them monthly. And you know, the, the salons were called the Abundance League, and it was something we organized. Me and a, and a couple of close friends. You know, we we sort of shared this idea that you know communities um, have a powerful influence on who you become and your opportunities. And and so why not create a community that would shape us into the type of people that we wanted to be? And so we created a salon to bring out the generosity and creativity of the people that showed up. And and the and we designed the meeting so that you know they started off with everyone talking about what they were passionate about or the project they were working on. Um, and these were projects that helped create abundance in some way, and or help people share or collaborate. And um, so they would say three things in one minute. So what am I working on that I'm passionate about? Um, what do I need for that? And um, what do I have to offer the community as a gift or a skill or something like that? And so after these announcements, you know, people would naturally just start matching up their offers and their gifts and, you know, people exchanged um, book recommendations and contacts and introductions and ideas and volunteered time. You know, there's no money involved. This was very grassroots and and it was just people helping people. It was sort of a gift economy, and you know, I did it, I did it sort of over this five-year period. And, and the meeting framed relationships in a new way. It assumed that 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 um, wealth was rooted in in our the quality of our experience and what we could create together in our relationships. And, and instead of sort of judging each other um, based on what we owned or what we earned um, or the position we had, it was more that we encountered one another as potential collaborators. We could work and create something together. Um, so this, 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 over doing this for five years, it, made, it completely changed my life. Uh, I, I felt like I stepped into a kind of a totally new reality um, with having that kind of understanding with a small group of, of people about how we can relate to each other in a new way. And, you know, all my best friends are from the Abundance League, and we supported each other's work along this uh, time. And all the work, you know, all, not all, but most of the work that I've gotten has come through and work that I wanted and that I chose or even designed. Like, Sherbel Magazine emerged from this. It was, I wrote a grant proposal. I sort of wrote my own job. Um, and this would have never have, uh, this opportunity would never have come to me unless I had hosted the, these, with friends, this, this, um, these salons, these conversations. Um, and so, you know, that, that, uh, that process, I learned a lot about how to create value outside of the money economy. And, um, and so I'll, I'll just share like three quick, quick lessons um, about, about what I, I learned. So the first has to do with wealth. So the gift economy of the Abundance League, um, this little salon, uh, makes, made me and makes me feel wealthy without money. Um, I'm amazed by the, the, the resources that have turned up that I have access to just because of the relationships that I've, that I've built and the community that's there. And so I feel like if I need something, I can get it. I don't, I don't feel like uh, a scarcity. Um, I, it's a kind of interesting sort of feeling of security that I have. And so, um, but even more than that, things come to me that I don't ask for but that I need, that my friends know me well enough from uh, doing this and what I'm about and what I'm trying to do is that they network me and they know what I need before I know what I need. Um, and and uh, so this is a kind of thing, having, having that access, knowing that I can get things if I need them and having things flow to me without trying, this is a kind of, a sort of liberation uh, a, a liberating feeling that I didn't think even was possible. And, and uh, so uh, now, it's, now it's an interesting time. Since, since then, the, the social web has become the norm. And, and uh, you know, now you can start a support network in minutes you, on like Kiva or Facebook or Kickstarter, or take your platform. And, and what I created in a small group can be created on a global scale. And, and so there, what we're seeing and what we're writing about on Shareable is, or some of the things that we're writing about are the, these new web-based platforms that allow people to share, like Airbnb and, um, and couch surfing and ThreadUp and Relay Rides. I mean, people are sharing uh, houses and cars and clothes, their in, most intimate possessions, you know, toys, books, meals. Sharing is become a, becoming a lifestyle. And, you know, entrepreneurs are designing communities 
to really bring out the best uh, in people and the better community member you are, the more access you have to resources. So this is a kind of a new wealth with, which actually brings people together as opposed to the money economy which tends to pit people against one another. The second lesson is that, is that uh, this, uh, there's kind of a different kind of community that's, that's emerging. For the individual in a large hierarchy or traditional community, you know, the, the future is kind of mapped out and the roles are prescribed. You know, choices are, are somewhat limited. Uh, I think things are like 180 degrees from that now, that, that, that uh, the individual has almost unprecedented agency and choice and almost too much and so need community um, even more um, as a way of helping the individual find um, the, their purpose, their project that they should work on, that they uh, want to select themselves, you know? And, and so uh, maybe the most important form of social production is what we, the social production, how we produce each other you know, how we guide each other in this world which has become very complex and unpredictable, um, uh, lots of uncertainty, that that's what we can be to each other, can be a kind of guide. Yeah, and, and, um, and that's this, I think that's kind of the new social contract between creative people, um, now that these hierarchies are sort of breaking down and failing to serve. Um, and this contract is based on, like Marina was talking about, about peer, peer relationships with, you know, there's mutual respect and collaboration and openness and authenticity. And, and I, I think what we, we, we can reset our expectations about what's possible in our lives. The same way that Wikipedia um, kind of reset people's expectations about what we can create collectively, we can, we can reset those about what we're able to do when we open up the process of our own development to other, other creative people. Um, and, and, and it's possible that everyone could have the kind of experience that I had, um, where, where my peers are, are kind of producing me, where my life emerges from their interactions with me. Um, and so the last thing, the last lesson is, is that, you know, so, so I'm talking about something, maybe, maybe it's, it's, that, it's that a new way of organizing isn't so new. Um, you know, artists have a long history of organizing themselves in communities of practice and birthing new movements. Um, I think the thing that's different is that this new mode um, is becoming the norm for a huge number of people, for knowledge workers and creatives. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is hundreds of millions of people around the world, and 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 they know that that uh, they have the, the the idea, the awareness that great creative works. Uh, emerge from milieus, from contexts, and so creatives are intentionally designing communities and spaces to bring out the potential of its members. So we, the rise of co-working spaces and hacker spaces, community kitchens, worker co-ops, caravans of food trucks, and all those online collaboration platforms we see are sort of attest to this trend. And, and so, you know, some believe the rise of this class will transform form the world for the better. I think that's a possibility that's real. And, and it's, I think it's an exciting prospect for artists um, because um, the story of this class, knowledge workers and creatives, architects and software programmers, et cetera, the story has not been told. The myths have not been created yet. The poems and the songs and the paintings and the videos and the code hasn't been, it's, that's the opportunity. Um, and my sense is that this community desperately needs your help to make sense of their place in the world. Um, they need to come of age. They need an initiation that the shaman, that the artist can deliver, that can trigger. And they need to see the role that they can play um, in, in the world, turning a planetary crisis into a planetary renaissance. And it, it our, the fate of our species might even count on this. Um, so, you know, you're, you could be, um, and my thought is, is that you are the vanguard of this, this revolutionary force. Um, for, for the first time in history, um, you know, I think that a society is emerging where the, val where the dominant value system is that of the artist. So I just, I'll just close with a question, which is, you know, how might you manifest this new social reality in your art? How might you help midwife the culture of sharing into a new 
durable reality.